Hey folks, my name is Jessica Mashkovich, and today I have a reoccurring guest who is one of my favorite in the VR, AR, AV, PDQ, UX, I don't know, um, virtual reality, augmented reality. Uh, what other words go with those letters? This is Alex Porter from Mod Tech Labs. Welcome back to One Take with Jess. Um, Thank you for having me. That alphabet soup is definitely um, overwhelming at times. Uh, yeah, it's the AR, VR, MR, XR, AI, IoT, blah, blah, ML, CV. I mean, there's a billion of them, but the cool part is that this is all culminating now into what we are starting to recognize as the metaverse. Yes. And um, it's interesting how all of these things will play a separate yet distinct role in bringing reality into a different reality. So, um, some things that you had been working on for a long time. I mean, you've been in this augmented reality, virtual reality space for a while. And do you feel that, I mean, we're just going to get right into the thick of it. Do you feel like this whole exuberance about the metaverse and Facebook changing its name to meta and NFTs flying around all over the place and conversations about web three, do you feel like this is the time? This is like your time to shine. You've already gotten your 10,000 hours in. Um, you guys are now hitting the ground running with a lot more eyes on you because now people are turning to other people who have been in this space for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. It really is a culmination of, you know, so many technologies and so many like siloed, you know, functionalities that are finally coming together in Web3 and Metaverse, depending on who you ask, you know, could be, could be synonymous, right, or an extension of each other. And so there's a really cool opportunity, right, for what really boils down to more interaction, more experience, and more communication. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, you know, through the last, you know, two years of everyone living various versions of quarantine and, you know, health concerns and a ton of other, you know, world shifts uh, to remote work and all these kinds of things, we're all a little bit more accustomed to a virtual experience now. And I think there is, a, you know, this opportunity and this desire, right, for everyone to have a better virtual experience. You know, we all have had our, you know, endless days of Zoom um, or <laughs> Hangouts or you name it. And ultimately, it really boils down to, you know, how do, what's the next phase for that? How do we interact with each other in a more, like, effective and human way? And I think that that's what metaverse and web three are really going to help accomplish. Right. And you see people fumbling through it. Like I've seen people, you know, get seasick from Oculus glasses and, you know, those headsets that you put on or, um, try and hold a, a party in Decentraland, which I attended the other day. And I was like, cool, I'm here. I'm in the metaverse. And it was, it was, it was clunky. It was weird. It was awkward. It was definitely, um, it was virtual reality in a way. There was a dance floor, there was a bar, there were chairs, there were other people. And I feel like it is still very clunky. People are learning how to walk around it like for the first time or how to perceive the environment around them and then how to even interact with, with other people who are also like finding their way. You're not up to the point yet where you can sit and chit chat because everyone's like, how do I press the dance button or the sit down button? Or <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it, I would not say they're necessarily the most intuitive yet, for sure. <laughs> so there's a lot of room for improvement, right? And, and, you know, depending on, you know, who you ask, and this is sort of for all of this conversation, right? Everyone has a different opinion of like what the metaverse is or isn't. Um, and a lot of that has yet to be determined. Like we're in the phase of, all these really cool platforms that have really been pushing the envelope in, you know, VR or AR. So if you think about, you know, Facebook horizons, you know, different Oculus, you know, metaverse worlds um, into, you know, Snap, Snapchat, um, which is not VR, Snapchat is AR. And then you go from there, from these siloed companies that are doing sort of individual things, or even if you think Fortnite, right? Um, these are all virtual experiences, virtual worlds. And in some way they have to come together. And that's really what the metaverse is in my mind. It's a culmination of all of these siloed things, be able to actually talk to each other. And so when we get to a point where there is interoperability, meaning you can take your 
digital goods, your avatars, your skins from one platform to another platform seamlessly, that's when it starts getting even more interesting. That's when it starts becoming this sort of decentralized metaverse realization. And so yeah. there's and that's a, the there's essence a, of the immersing, the immersive experience is to really not know, you know, if you've if you've left a certain property and are now in a different reality, like the whole immersive experience is to kind of function in the metaverse as if you were functioning in real life without the disjointed nature of things. Can you explain yeah. the difference between virtual reality and augmented reality? Because you said yeah. that Snap was a, a virtual reality versus an augmented reality, AR versus VR. Other way. Yep. Oh. So Snap, Snap is augmented reality, uh, meaning you, uh, it's like a sticker on the world, right? And so you look at those, you know, filters and they're changing your face, right? They're changing your skin color or they're putting a funny mask on you or something like that. So it's still your face that's actually mapping to, um, or if you turn the camera around and you're doing something in a room, it still sees the room, the existing real space that you're in, but it has some sort of digital overlay. Mm. And so that's augmented reality and virtual reality. Like you were talking about um, Oculus and the headsets, the, the head mounted displays, HMDs, um, another, another acronym, another three little word um, <laughs> goes on the head, on the, on the eyes, and you're in a completely immersive world. Um, so you're not interacting with the real world, other than the fact that you are present in it and you must be semi-aware of what's around you <laughs> so you don't bump into it. Uh, but we're going to see more and more, I think, of the fusion, right? Which which could be considered mixed reality or extended reality where you're combining asset aspects of both. And so some of the newer you know, headsets, um, the new Meta Oculus, Oculus Meta, I'm not sure what it's called now. Um, <laughs> they actually have forward facing cameras. So the camera can see the world around you. And now that allows for this virtual environment that's on your face to interact with the outward reality of your space. And so it creates this opportunity for oh. that mixed merged scenario where so you, you are actually VR, AR at the same yeah. time. Exactly. Exactly. Huh. And I think that's where, I think that's where we're going to really start seeing, you know, the movement happening. You know, Apple has been on the, um, secret developing some kind of AR glasses <laughs> uh, yet, yet to be determined what what that actually looks like right but I think that they're really I think they held out on developing a product because they knew that that traditional VR in in the sense that it has been in the last you know five to seven years is not really the answer um, it's harder for people to you know wrap their heads around you know putting something on their face and and doing the whole immersive thing that's why I think AR has been much more accepted because it is the, that interaction of the digital and the physical. Mm -hmm. And so when you can combine the two of them and you get, you know, much more streamlined headsets that are affordable and easier to use and dual purpose, then you're going to start seeing a much more sort of mass commercialization opportunity in this world. Mm -hmm. Do you think that people would be um, more apt to wear those doggle things, um, the headset if they had like a window on the side that allowed them to see the real world. So if they needed to reconnect with the real world, like just for grounding purposes, or I'm just making that up. Is that something the that- The general problem with that is, is the that- The classes it's... seem to be like a yeah. hybrid of that, where you would yeah. still be able to see that you're in real life if you need to. I think, I think it boils down to like a materials- problem. Um, yeah. We don't necessarily at this point have the, the ability to commercialize headsets that can do that mm. because it requires like special kinds of lighting, special kinds of ocular, you know, scientific techniques that actually create the visuals. Um, and so I think you have to, it's a balance of like quality. It's a balance of, you know, availability for materials. Um, and I just, I don't think we've solved that yet to my knowledge, but I'm not a hardware specialist. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So um, getting back to the whole, you know, everything is now going meta and the metaverse, um, NFTs, how much of what you do is now really crossing over into the 
the, the market for like consumers, like are consumers consuming what you guys are putting together in the virtual reality and the augmented reality space? Or is this something that would be for companies to be leveraging to, you know, create digital goods or to create um, more immersive experiences for their own customers or their own clients? Where are you seeing activity lift on your end of things? Yeah, absolutely. So we're, uh, we are a B2B company. So we sell to businesses and we see an opportunity for what's called B2B to C. So we sell to a business and they sell to a consumer. Right now, um, you know, our focus has been on 3D content creation and making that a much more easy process because the typical process um, takes around six days, 13 artists um, and crazy amounts of software um, and knowledge to actually produce a single 3D asset, um, not to mention just the, the compute and all of the other pieces and parts behind it. And so it's, it's really not scalable is the problem. And so, need that <laughs> microphone. <laughs> So the reason that that is, right, um, scalability is important because as we're bridging into this metaverse virtual world's time, everything, everything needs to be digitized, right? From your sneakers, to your glasses, to your couch, to, to yep, exactly, to your favorite collectibles, um, into the art world, right? So I look at NFTs, interestingly, as sort of the, the gateway drug to the metaverse, so my thinking on this is that there is, you know, there's a group of people out there. It's a lot of people that are gamers. Um, they already understand virtual commerce. They understand, you know, buying goods that are only virtual, you know, an avatar, a skin, um, a power up, those kinds of things. And that's not, that's not uncommon for them. And so to bridge the gap from gamers to metaverse, I think is going to be really simple um, mm -hmm. to bridge the gap from your standard, you know, consumer to metaverse, I think is harder because they haven't had as much experience in the digital commerce realm. And so NFTs, I think, bridge that gap a bit, creating an opportunity for, you know, someone who isn't a gamer, but is an art collector to understand the same sort of process of purchasing a virtual good and having it reside in a virtual world and understanding what you do with it and what you don't do with it and how it can actually extend, you know, your opportunity for, you know, wealth. It can extend your opportunity for, you know, a lot of other really interesting things that I think are yet to be kind of determined. But um, that's, that's how I see sort of the progression of NFTs moving. Mm -hmm. And right now, NFTs are primarily digital art, right? And so there's a lot of controversy around this. How, how does anything end up with value? Well, the market values it and the market pays for it. That's, that's how value is created. And so ultimately, you know, I see the opportunity for the real world to be digitized and use NFTs as a mechanism for authentication, verification, ownership, um, fractionalization, and a ton of other cool ways that we really can't functionally do right now with you know, physical collectibles. So think baseballs, baseball cards, sports paraphernalia. Like it doesn't, it doesn't really matter because at that point you're, you are creating a digital twin of a physical good and creating a revenue stream from something that you physically own. Yes, very true. That is definitely uh, one aspect, one use case for NFTs. And like, just going back to what you said about gamers, they've already seen the utility of what these things bring to them as far as gamers go. Um, you know, they, they'll stick to a particular uh, venue or a particular game and use all of those things that they've purchased and they could resell it on the secondary market. So they've actually definitely experienced um, what we're all experiencing now as with NFTs and the secondary market and scarcity and value and utility. Yes. that can be derived from all of these things. Um, I was talking to my husband the other day and I'm like, who would have thought that, you know, the gamers would be the ones that have already <laughs> earned their yeah. time in this space and are just going to, like I said to you, they've already put in their 10,000 hours and they hit the ground running. They're like, we know this place, you know, now you guys are newcomers and, yeah. and we've already, you know, seen the benefits of what this can be. Um, 
So when it comes to the regular people coming in and the regular people being like, okay, I need to either be an investor in, NA, in NFTs or I need to be a creator of NFTs. Um, do I need to do a project? Do I need to create some kind of art that's going to be visually wowing and pleasing? Um, I mentioned to you that I was in Decentraland last week and I don't know if it was because of the amount of bandwidth that it takes to run these 3D things going on or this virtual reality thing that's happening, but I can log into Decentraland and my computer fan goes on right away. I have a Mac. I don't know if it's because I don't have a video card, you know, that's strong enough or there's just too much simultaneous stuff going on, but is virtual reality kind of are we equipped for virtual reality? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. And, and the answer is, is mostly no, unfortunately. Yeah, I this, don't think this so. Is, <laughs> this is part of the reason actually that we haven't really um, approached a consumer market with our tools. So our tools are, you know, a software solution um, for capturing and processing uh, 3D imagery data. And so we have an AR app um, that guides users to actually take the photos in the right places. Um, it will be available on the Android and iOS stores. Um, and then the next phase of that is it automatically uploads to our cloud processing solution, which has a ton of different microservices in it um, so that it can actually create the 3D asset. You don't have to understand all the pieces and parts and software. You don't have to have the processing capability on your computer, right? Or on your phone. You don't have to do any of that. We've actually taken care of all of the heavy lifting as far as the hardware and the optimization side of it. And really we're, we're relying on, you know, helping users understand how to capture effectively, how to use their camera. Um, and then ultimately, you know, what do they need to do with it at the end? Um, and so we're seeing a ton of different interesting use cases, right? From NFTs to virtual goods, um, to traditional sort of like 360 views on the internet, right? Of shoes and couches and purses. Um, there's a wide variety of uses, you know, for, for 3D assets and objects. And with the evolution of machine learning, we are seeing an opportunity in the near future mm -hmm. to make it more available to consumers. And so we are, we are heavily invested in a machine learning strategy um, for our algorithms and for how we are actually creating the tech behind the scenes. And this allows us to iterate on something that's very old. So photogrammetry really has its roots in like the late 1800s. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, they would go up in a hot air balloon, they would draw what was around them and they would map matching points. So that big oak tree in the middle, they would know, oh, from this point to this point is five miles, right? So fast forward that to the seventies, they digitized it. So now you can map points digitally. And honestly, they haven't done it ton since then. It's about the same. Um, we've had some hardware, you know, um, increases in speed so that it is much more efficient. Um, but ultimately, you know, it really comes down to the fact that machine learning is what makes it even easier and faster and more effective. Um, so you're talking accuracy for your imagery. Mm -hmm. um, and then you're also talking speed, right? Because commercially right now, you know, we are, we are looking at scale, you know, 45 minutes, 20 minutes, somewhere, somewhere between 20 and 45 um, to output the asset, right? Which is still significantly faster, but then there's a little bit of cleanup on the end, five to 10 minutes, depending on your level of, um, you know, artistry. <laughs> um, and then ultimately, you know, we're looking to get that down under 10 minutes because that's where I think there's a commercial viability. And we're working right now with Intel Labs on a specific computer uh, algorithm, um, excuse me, a machine learning algorithm that allows us to minimize the number of photos and create assets significantly faster. So they're working on the hardware enablement side and we're working on the machine learning training side. Okay. So just to, just to capture that again in, um, in my dumb words, um, the output is going to be some kind of 3d rendering of an object or an item or something. And basically it usually takes a lot more photos than what you guys are doing is you're working with Intel. You said Intel labs mm -hmm. to create some machine learning to, so that there's less photos that are needing to go into the input. 
and then you're using compression or something going on to make it faster in the processing side of it so that you can end up with the same result. But the intuitive part of the machine learning is really going to fill in any gaps that the less photos is going to provide because it's 100% teaching itself. <laughs> yeah, we actually have um, 166 terabytes of proprietary 3D data that we've used to train our algorithms. Um, this is a very weird like spec, but if you put it on CDs, like you filled up CDs, you could stack it literally taller than the Statue of Liberty. Like that's how, how much data it is. <laughs> that's a lot of data. That's a lot. That'll, uh, make, no. that'll make your computer fan start burning. <laughs> that's why, that's why we have servers. Right. That's why we have, I don't run any of that stuff on my computer. <laughs> I know I'm just kidding, but you know what, as the end user, we feel like, okay, well this stuff exists. So let's create it for ourselves. And we always simplify it and make it sound easier than it is. And the process itself might not be difficult. It might just be running the right, you know, algorithm to, to make it happen. But the bandwidth required, the, the pipe needed yeah. to funnel that type of that level, that, that great, enormous amount of information from one place to another. Um, you know, you can't underestimate that because you can't like, you'll blow out all your circuits in your house and all of a sudden end up in the dark. <laughs> very, very true. It's absolutely true. Yeah. Um, so you guys have the, the app that launched again, you had launched it, uh, I think in beta a little while ago, mm -hmm. and now you relaunched it. Is that for public availability? And that's going to give any end user the ability to capture, um, images yeah. of a particular item. Absolutely. So we that are want to uh, see in 3d eventually. Yes. <laughs> so our focus with the app um, originally was specifically to be an additive tool to get our business clients to have something they could test with instead of having to get data and sign NDAs and do all these things. Um, we just wanted them to get to the point of like testing the platform. And so we, we launched this in beta uh, just to see sort of what the reception was, get some feedback on it. And ultimately what we found is that we had a crazy amount of organic traffic. So 99% organic traffic which resulted in 14,000 downloads um, and about uh, 2,500 or 2,200 daily active users was our top um, while we were still running beta. And then uh, we were really like growing about 33% every month. Um, and this was over the course of, uh, you know, consistently over the course of about six months at the end of last year. Um, and what so were they like, capturing? Okay, what, what, they, what kind of images and who were they? Like, who were the people that ended yeah. up downloading the app and what were they capturing? So we started a survey at the end of uh, September to find out who was on the app. Um, and the first question was, you know, do you consider yourself a creator, um, an executive, an art director, or like a project manager? Um, and so ha about half of the folks that were, that were on the app were creators. So are honestly based on like the feedback and the users that we brought to the platform. Um, a lot of them are already in 3D scanning, 3D modeling, they're in art in some way. And so it gives them this extension and this ability to kind of upskill, even if they know photography, but they don't know photogrammetry, right? They're different things, but you need basic photography skills to do photogrammetry. And so, you know, it creates this opportunity for upskilling. Um, and so half of them creators, and then it broke down into about thirds for the other three, um, with, um, I think art directors being the highest. Um, and so a lot of, uh, the feedback from that survey also concluded that, you know, they're really looking for on the business side, they're looking for solutions because they can't, in, they can't implement this because they don't have enough training available to actually get people to upskill and be able to create this stuff. Uh, and then that, that locks them out for the amount of time that they can spend dedicating to it. Right. Because if you have to train people in house, it becomes this whole other, you know, metric of, you know, productivity that is really challenging to meet. Mm -hmm. And when so, you say train people in house, you mean train people in photogrammetry and mapping and 3Ding and making yeah. that stuff. So instead of outsourcing it, you can sort of half outsource it mm -hmm. and at least have the tool to take the images yourself instead of having someone come in and or bringing your items out to another company in itself. So the typical 3D team, if you we're building it from scratch has about 13 artists. 
Mm -hmm. um, and this is not even on the capture side. This is just the like post-production piece. And so you would have at least one person that was on the photogrammetry side as well. So we're talking like 14 people dedicated to just capturing and processing the asset itself. And then of course there's like probably five or six management folks. Um, so you're looking at over 20 people on a team to make a 3D pipeline even semi-functional. Mm -hmm. um, and then, like I mentioned before, it takes about six days to do a single 3D asset. And so if you think about just the catalog of like, whatever, you know, a, a store, right? Who wants to Ashley Home Furnishings, who like, it doesn't really matter. But some like, think about the amount of furniture that they have in their, you know, the amount of SKUs that they have which is outrageous, like thousands upon thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of pieces of furniture. Right. How do you do that effectively in a timely manner um, and like really use your resources to the best of your ability? And what they typically do, honestly, is they, most folks have skewed away from photo realism, um, taking photos and digitizing it because it is actually a higher barrier. It's a higher barrier than just modeling. And so 3D modeling, is what I consider an artist's interpretation of a real thing. So a 3D modeler, uh, at some sometimes they'll have um, like manufacturing CAD data to go from, where they can use that to, you know, actually build out the the sizing and the specs of the piece of furniture. But oftentimes they'll just have a photo to go from, and then they have to recreate that thing from scratch mm -hmm. and make it match the image of the actual object. And so we're definitely on the side of, of photorealism, um, focused on making that piece that much easier, faster, and simpler to do without mm -hmm. a huge team. Okay. So the app itself now gets in the hands of your client at Ashley mm -hmm. Furniture, for example, just making this up. And they hire an intern or whomever to go and set up how, just like walk me through it and then where it ends up meeting you. So you said that the team would be a whole bunch of bodies of people and processing all this stuff if they were to do it in-house. Where, after they capture the, the photos of each individual item at Ashley Furniture, um, what happens? The images come to you guys and you end up processing it. Or, and how many people does it take on your end? How have you cut that down completely? I think you maybe mentioned that before. Like it, it yeah. takes much less time and much less people. So, so it's significant, yeah, significantly faster because it's, uh, a, depending on the size of the, the data, sometimes mm -hmm. that equates to the size of the object through the app, it's typically 20 to 45 minutes to process and, and give back the 3D asset. Um, so no one touches it on our side. It's a completely oh. automated process. Okay. Um, I thought that you guys have to do something with it in order to process it and then deliver it back. This is all like, wow, this is, um, <laughs> yeah, complete, complete, complete. We could, we say, uh, human imagination, machine creation. <laughs> That's, that's one of our I think I'm going to have to download the new version. I know Vlad and I were like playing around with the, with the original version, but I think I'm going to have to download the new version and start experimenting on, on certain yes. things in our house. Absolutely. Yeah. We've updated our, our best practices because, um, another piece of photogrammetry, um, knowledge, uh, it's, it's not effective for capturing things that are shiny, sheeny, reflective, refractive at this point. We are working that machine learning algorithm that I mentioned. Another piece of that is that it actually allows you to capture things that have been traditionally uncapturable mm -hmm. um, because the machine learning actually understands how to deal with reflections and refractions and actually still map points effectively. Um, so that's another iteration. And we're anticipating being able to push at least V1 of that um, out within the next couple of months is what we're looking at. That's awesome. And how is it with furry things and with hair? Like if you're trying to capture someone's head, how is it with hair? I know that that was a big problem for Disney, like forever. Hair and snow, for some reason, can't be yes. captured efficiently. Um, yeah, or, or snow is definitely animated. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, hair. Um, our our best practices talk about uh, minimizing the amount of like wispy flowy moving parts. So when you're trying to map something in 3D, right, if, if your hair is moving um, or, or you, you know, if you can hold completely still while you're being captured, fine. But if you like turn your head and suddenly your hair is a different place, then it, it actually does affect the ability to map the images, right? Um, and so 
our general, you know, best practices, just make sure the hair is kind of matted down um, or like in, in place, if you will, whether it's, it doesn't have to necessarily be gelled or anything like that. Um, but we are, you know, just constantly working on figuring out ways to improve the output of those items that are already really challenging. Um, I haven't tried to capture snow. We live in Texas and <laughs> not really a thing here. So <laughs> Well, um, it but probably that, wouldn't sure, work because it's yeah. it's snow is like furry and snow is constantly moving and it's got so many little nooks and crannies. Yeah, I mean it's definitely that you know reflective, refractive, shine sheen. It's got all the things that are not good for photogrammetry. <laughs> um, and so I would love to test some snow captures when we get this machine learning algorithm in place and see how effective that is. You'll have to come up north then. <laughs> <laughs> um, how is it when the file is done? What sort of file size are you looking at? And is this something that can be uploaded and sold as an NFT? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So right now, 3D files uh, return at about a gig. Um, and so we are working again on with uh, a similar machine learning algorithm. There's there's a multitude of them. Um, we're working on another solution that actually takes it from a gig down to a half a megabyte, um, which will make it super portable mm -hmm. um, and and super functional, sort of across different <laughs> metaverse worlds um, and different use cases. Uh, we are in process right now with a partner, um, Palm uh, IO which is a company that's like a payment layer, um, much like Stripe for NFTs. And so they do minting, they have their own chain, they have their own uh, you know, token. And so the functionality there is that we're working on a pipeline that's direct from 3D to NFT. So you don't even have to take it out of our pipeline or out of our system in order to mint an NFT and then you can publish it on any platform. Okay, so you're minting it. When you say minting it, you're minting it on the blockchain. So its existence is going to be minted on the blockchain. Now, yes. is the file itself, it's probably not going to reside on the blockchain. Is it going to reside on an outside server? Because a lot of um, what's going on in NFT land is um, people do have their NFTs. It's minted on the blockchain. You're the owner. There's record of it forever that you were the owner. Um, however, because these assets are stored off chain on a server, uh, there's a file name that calls to it, you know, calls for it on the server. And at times, you know, there, the risk is, is that the server won't be there. Like for example, the server vanished, it, it you know, someone didn't pay their bill, their hosting fee, <laughs> or, you know, or maybe they just changed the file that's sitting there so that it's now a different file with the same file name. And it's not exactly what you paid for. <laughs> mm -hmm. There's a yeah, lot of I mean, risks when things are off chain. Um, but is your asset going to reside on chain? Our goal on is to allow folks to choose, but once we have the ability to create those half a meg file by yeah. file sizes. Um, there's no reason it can't be on chain. Yeah. Um, the only reason I, is, you know, gas fees and, and that, you know, those types of things, um, which, which we, I think are being yeah. improved on, you know, every day. Yeah. The solution that we're working on with Palm, um, does not have such exorbitant gas fees. I don't know exactly what their gas fee is at this juncture, but I believe it is less significantly less, um, than some of the other more standard chains yeah. out there. <laughs> and so I think, I think a lot of it is about that sort of democratization and that ability to secure it more effectively. And that's the way that we're looking at it. Um, the other, you know, uh -huh. benefit of 3d for NFTs is that you now have millions of points of reference to authenticate something. And so when you have a real world object and you're, you're trying to verify and authenticate it, you know, to create an NFT, there's an opportunity to really, really, you know, test it against a ton of other, you know, opportunity, you know, uh, digital assets out there to make sure that it is like the real authentic version and it doesn't compete with any other version. Um, so I think, I think that's another layer that is really interesting. Yeah, that is, that is, that's like an x-ray or a scan or, you know, something like that, where it's, it is what it is. Even if it's off by a smidge, it's not the real thing because it shouldn't be off by a smidge. You know, it should be mm -hmm. exactly as it's shown. Um, the, what, what was the other thing that Tim sounds like he has a cough. Is he feeling well? <laughs> I hear him in the we, we were all, we were all sick last week or the week before last. Now we're, yeah. now we're better. <laughs> all better. I do. I have a call in three minutes. 
Oh, you do? Okay. Sorry. We didn't even get to talk about the fact that you're going to be um, at South by Southwest. Uh, you're the top, one of the top five uh, from 600 people that had applied for this opportunity to, um, it's called Pitch, but what are you going to be doing there? Yeah. So it's a global, you know, audience. And so it gives us the opportunity to get up there and do a quick three minute pitch about our company and share, you know, really sort of the story of what we're doing, why we're doing it and why they're the, why we're the right people to solve the problem. Um, and so I'm super excited for the chance to just, you know, speak at such a large, you know, venue with such an amazing audience. And uh, it was uh, very, very flattering to be chosen in the top five for AI voice and robotics category. I was like, this is an interesting mixed bag of things. <laughs> uh, so I know, I know that we have, you know, uh, some great competitors and I think it's going to be a really wonderful opportunity just to share about what we're doing. That's awesome. I have one more question and then I'll let you go. When you close your eyes and go to sleep, what do you envision this world being like with what you guys do and what sort of creative ideas do you come up with? Like, here's where we can play a role and here's what it's going to look like in five years. And, and, you know, we're going to help make this happen. Where do you see stuff? What's the future? I love it. Um, I really do think that, you know, the direction that we're moving with the, the portable file types, the small file types, um, that is foundational for metaverse functionality. And so that creates a really interesting opportunity for us to, to secure some, you know, intellectual property in this arena. Um, we are looking to file patents, um, specifically around some of these ideas, uh, and, and really be sort of embedded in everything. Um, there, you know, there are a ton of different directions that the metaverse is being created from. You need the hardware aspect, you need the software aspect, you need the commerce aspect, right? And so being a piece of that core mm -hmm. that makes so much more functional uh, is really exciting to me. And, and we really just want to be one of the players that helps, you know, digitize reality, right? So are you and I um, going to be like, I think are you and I going to be chatting on a couch in the metaverse or do you, are you going to be Absolutely. watching your kids play at the Louvre? Like where, what, what do you see? What do you envision? I, I mean, I see really, you know, sort of endless opportunities to, to consume and communicate and create um, that really haven't been there before. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would love, I would love to take my kids to the, to the digital Louvre. Like I haven't um, actually done a ton of museum tours with them yet, but I think that they would just be fascinated. They're just getting to the age where they're going to be interested in that, I think. Um, and I, I'm just, I'm just so excited by the possibilities. I honestly, my biggest piece is just the realism piece, right? Because mm -hmm. I think, you know, if you think about Disney, right? So Walt Disney created Cinderella's castle in the movie, right? He used inspiration from a real castle in Germany. And then he had the magical idea to create an experience. So Disneyland and Disney World brought fantasy to reality again. And so I think that that's really the culmination of what's happening with all of the metaverse mm -hmm. experiences that we, we all get to design and make and create in yeah. any way we want. Okay, cool. <laughs> Uh, thank you once again for the chat. We will, uh, we'll do this again every now and then so we can see what's going on in the metaverse and in all the realities that you deal with. <laughs> all the realities. <laughs> all the realities, the magical realities. <laughs> okay, awesome. anything that you want to plug anywhere that you want to name the app or anything? Um, Absolutely. The app is on, going to be on Android and iOS this week. Um, it is the Mod 3D Scanner. Uh, you can also go to our website and sign up for a trial and check out the web app um, and modtechlabs.com. And we are fundraising. We are crowd fundraising right now. And we are looking forward to having, you know, passionate enthusiast folks join us as investors. Um, if you, you know, see the vision for the metaverse and you, something that I've said has resonated with you, love to talk to you more, love for you to potentially invest. It's as little as a hundred dollars and it's on uh, wefunder.com. Is there a link Search to that us. also from your website to the WeFunder or is it separate? It's not currently on the website, but it will be. 
Okay. Very I, could, I could put that link in the description when I launch the Perfect. podcast as well. Awesome. Okay. Keep making Thank magic. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. <laughs> Thank you. You too. Bye. Bye.